All right, welcome back. So happy holidays, everyone, in the United States. Um, <clears throat> there's a holiday today called uh, Juneteenth. Um, so uh, I have uh, off from work. Um, it's uh, uh, Juneteenth marks our second uh, largest. Uh, in so it's it's like a second Independence Day. Um, July fourth, uh, the United States became independent from. Uh, uh, Britain, and uh, on Juneteenth, uh, the um, uh, slavery was uh, formally uh, ended. Um, <clears throat> it's uh, <clears throat> the day that the Emancipation Proclamation was uh, put into effect, from what I understand, but there were still challenges afterwards but this is the official day june 9th june 19th 1865 where um uh there were uh a quarter million <clears throat> enslaved people and um the uh emancipation proclamation um became um oh see it, it gets weird because because the Emancipation Proclamation was already the law of the land for two and a half years. So, like, I, I, I'm not sure what is significant about this day. Um, that is more significant than like, uh, other days. Um, I guess, I guess what's, I guess what's significant because this is not because what I mean by that is that this is not the day when the Emancipation Proclamation was drafted or went into effect. As I said earlier which I, we can see i was wrong about um this this has to do with uh military action so so this is when um okay so this this is when um This is this is the final day where where the enforcement of it actually. Oh man, <laughs> see it gets so weird because the people did not gain their freedom until the ratification of the Thirteenth Amendment uh, on December sixth, eighteen sixty five. But we're celebrating something that happened months earlier, and then and then the Emancipation Proclamation itself was passed two years earlier. So it it gets a bit um it gets a bit confusing sometimes as to what what is actually it, it, basically let me put it this way the history of the united states is fascinating um it's uh deep and it requires a lot of uh gratitude for the uh uh, uh continuous and ongoing academic uh work that has put it put into preserving it and that still has a ways to go in preserving it uh uh preserving it onward into the future but anyway um so that so got a lot of extra time for a video today is is what um is why i'm bringing this up because it's a holiday so if you're from around the world you might not be uh familiar with this and might necessarily um, not want me to, to spend the video on this and, and get back to what we were doing. So I'm going to do that because uh, that I want to do that too. So uh, what we were doing is um, situational. There, there, so there's <clears throat> a former employee of OpenAI. Um, it, and he, he's former. He left it. He was on the team that aligns it, that, that makes AI safe. And he left it, which is kind of scary. <laughs> Hopefully they replace him with someone better. But he wrote a uh, PDF that kind of outlines what the next 10 years of AI progress will look like. He wrote it uh, this year and this month. So this is hot off the presses. Uh, this was published at the beginning of the month and we're now in the mid to end of this month. So this was published a few weeks ago, hot off the presses. And one of the most important points made so far is that the rate of progress of AI 
is unimaginable. It's happening faster than the rate of just about any other technology has progressed. And if you think of what computers looked at, used to look like in, in the 90s, um, that's going to mean a lot. I mean, I'll show you, I'll show you what, what we had in, you know, this, something like this. I had, I, I were, I had this growing up. Like, like I'm, I'm only 39 and like, you know, this, this, this is like this, this is a bit before my time. I, some of the neighbors had something like this. Um, my family wasn't the wealthiest on the block, so they we were kind of uh, keeping up with the Joneses a bit late, um, which you know kind of works to your advantage during a uh, such a huge advancement because you know if you because in addition to the things getting more powerful, they're going to get uh, lower priced. So by the time you can afford one in in a uh, rapid technological progress by this one. If you can afford less and less and less, you're going to eventually buy something more and more and more powerful. It's the people that can afford the latest and greatest thing that get screwed over pretty much because uh, they're buying something that uh, can do less for more money. But there are some advantages. Um, I'm kind of putting myself in that camp by paying $20 per month for ChatGPT. So I'm paying um, money for something that later will be free and ubiquitous all throughout society and will be orders of magnitude better. Um, and how many orders of magnitude better will it be? According to this PDF, it'll be about two orders of magnitude better uh, by 2027. And what does that mean? What does it mean for something to be two orders of magnitude better? Well, what does it mean for a soccer ball in a soccer stadium or, or let's say a basketball in a basketball stadium to be two orders of magnitude larger. So it, it depends on the ball, but but what an order of magnitude is, is it's a uh, size differential across an increase in measurement units. The increase of measurement units is a factor of 10. So if you have a 30 centimeter ball, um, which kind of is about a soccer ball. Soccer ball is a bit uh, smaller. Kind of is like a women's basketball. Men's basketball is a little bit bigger. That That's an order of magnitude larger than a 30 centimeter ball is going to be a 300 centimeter ball. An order of magnitude larger than a 300 centimeter ball is going to be a 3,000 centimeter ball. How big is a 3,000 centimeter ball? 30 meters in diameter it's the size of a 10-story building so so this is this is a way you can imagine what's going to happen to ai by the time of 2027 it's going to grow if we put it down in, in between the the out of bound line and the half uh field line in a soccer ball stadium and we just put it down there and let it let it uh sit the soccer ball is going to grow um, over uh, f about three years to fill up half the stadium and to be to be the size of a 10-story building to reach all the way across half of that field. So it's going to go from from this soccer ball, so soccer, soccer field. And let's look at some images. Yeah, so this this is this is like a good one. Um, we want to see the actual ball. So the ball is going to grow from from what we see here on the field to reaching all the way across these these lines here and then to be probably at least as tall as as like this Q2 symbol here. You know, it's it's going to be it's going to change that much. And if you think about what that would mean for soccer, that means next week, you know, you know next month at this rate of growth it's going to completely change how you would play soccer. I mean, anyone who's like a professional soccer ball player, I'm sure if you start using even a ball that's, you know, if it was 30 centimeters and now it's 40 centimeters in diameter, that would change so much about like how soccer is played. But now it increases by an order of magnitude. I mean, I mean, that'll happen in, uh, in like by next year, it'll increase in a full order of magnitude. So like imagine playing 
with a 300 uh, centimeter ball, you know, like, like, so like 300, uh, some two feet. So it's going to be, it's going to be a 10 foot ball. It's going to be bigger than any player on the field. You know, how are you even going to play soccer with that? You, you can't, the ball is too big. You, people would get injured. They get, you know, you can't play with a ball that big. And AI is going to make that kind of a, a change next year. You know, it's going to it's going to get to the point where we can't play soccer anymore with what we have. It, we're not going to have ChatGPT anymore. It's it's going to be different. It, it, it's going to be unrecognizable than it is now. Um, you're not going to have the same pay structures. It's not going to cost twenty dollars a month. Everything's going to be different. The experience with it is going to be way different. It's going to be uh, it's going to be used in other novel creative use cases that don't exist now everything's going to be completely different in a way we can't imagine greater than our most optimistic estimates next year um and then and then a few years after that you know it's it's just completely unimaginable what what it's going to be like it's going to be two orders of magnitude beyond what it is now if it were a soccer ball it would grow so big that it would fill up half the stadium so hope and this is where it matters to get it right um when it grows up that big what is it going to be designed to do is it going to be a soccer ball with spikes on it that just is designed to destroy everything and everyone or is it going to be a soccer ball that's like an art display and you can uh you know it has some value to humanity so um it's um yeah it's it's i feel like this yeah so th this is a timely this is important thing to read so let's make uh no more um uh waste of time here and try to get through as much as possible so in step two yeah so i read through here for the last one <clears throat> um to bring everyone up to speed uh, what we're doing, what we're doing, what this whole part is, this is uh, from GPT-4 to AGI, AGI, counting the OMs. It's establishing the fact that uh, the trend lines all point to a two order of magnitude rate of growth by the year 2027. And it's kind of explaining what that means, you know, you know, and, and what we just finished here is how are they testing these, uh, th these AIs? Well, what they're doing is they're making the AIs take benchmark exams like the LSAT, the SAT, uh, specialized uh, exams that are designed to test AIs and not humans. So they're designed to be way harder than a human could ever do unless it, w it was like the top human in the world for that subject. The best student in the world in biology going for their third PhD or whatever uh, related to the field might get a 90% on this test. They might do pretty well. Um, so, uh, but everyone else in the world would get a 0%. They, they wouldn't even understand the first word. We didn't even know where to write their name on the, on the test. So, uh, AIs are, are doing like 50% on those. So like, so th that's, that's the point that's being made is when you compare this against what a human can do, you know, we're talking about a matter of months before the smartest humans, in the world uh are just pale in comparison to what an ai can do i mean that's that's going to happen in months and we can think about that in terms of, of the soccer ball growing to fuel the stadium you know you know by the time the soccer ball is bigger than a human um it, it's it's grown in in one order of magnitude like you know it's it's not it's like like two orders of magnitude of growth happens in in a way where that um yeah like like it, it, yeah so so let's so yeah so we look back at, at alpha go which was the first ai system to beat the world champions at, at go um we look back at, at a number of things so let's continue here developing the equivalent of step two for llms is a key research problem for overcoming the data wall Oh yeah, 
and moreover will ultimately be the key to suppress passing human level intelligence and this is another thing so what they mean by the data wall is these llms are trained by giving it mass amounts of data well we don't have mass amounts of data we we have you know the computer uh revolution started in like the 90s you know so we we have a fair amount you know like 30 years but you know the more you give it the better so that's going to be a limitation soon is we just don't have the kind of data it needs but what what the author leopold argues here is that it, it doesn't matter like it's not going to slow down any of the progress because it's a multifaceted. um the the reason why it's growing reasons why it's growing are multifaceted one of the reasons it's growing is because we have more data than we, we've ever had in the history of human society and we're feeding it to this machine which it likes uh but another reason it's growing is uh we're giving it more power we're, we're prioritizing this like companies are 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 spending billions and billions of dollars on this and standing up their own their own data centers governments are involved in this you know, people care about making this happen. Um, and then there's a lot of advancement to be done too. Like the algorithms are, are still pretty barbaric. Um, if you look at the difference between GPT-2 and GPT-4, GPT-2, you know, it, it, it was unusable for an application like like uh, ChatGPT, you know, and, and we're going to look back and, and look at GPT-4, which is the underlying technology behind something like ChatGPT, in the same light. It's it's underdeveloped right now. And a reason why this two order of magnitude growth is going to happen by 2027 is because people are actively working on this and developing these algorithms and making steady progress. So it doesn't matter if all of a sudden overnight you know, they run out of data and they have to reuse the data that's already trained on. Um, first of all, not all data is equal. You don't want your, um, you only want to train your um, AI on a subsection of the data you have. Like you don't want it to, to learn bad things or incorrect things. You want it to learn from the good data and, and not learn from the bad data or if it does learn from the bad data to learn something that is aligned with like what what you want it for. Um, and uh, not only that, what does it mean to learn from data? You know, if you're if you're like me uh, reading reading these texts, well, there's all sorts of stuff I could do. You know, I, I just read these through, you know, I could take notes, I could uh, uh, reread it when I'm done. I could uh, phone in someone and discuss it. You know, there's there's greater uh, methods of deliberation than just reading through something. So perhaps building a more robust internal deliberation in the AI, uh, building uh, different methods with which to uh, learn the material. What if the AI learns to make flashcards for itself or like if it learns to uh, get a study group or something for itself you know that's just one thing that can go wrong in the development of ai it running out of data but it's a non-issue and then likewise uh if the algorithm uh improvements stop for a while you, you know we've, we're not up against this data wall yet so it's still got a lot of progress to make with the data we have um it, yeah, it's just uh, we're still investing all kinds of money and interest into this thing. So it's a multifaceted uh, reason why this thing continues to grow. And that makes it the growth really robust and unstoppable. All of this is to say that data constraints seem to inject large error bars either way into forecasting the coming years of AI progress. There's a very re real chance things stall out. LLMs might still be as big of a deal as the internet, but we won't get to truly crazy AJ, uh, the AGI. But I think it's reasonable to guess that the labs will crack it. 
And doing so will not just keep the scaling curves going, but possibly enable huge gains in model capability. Yeah, so the running out of data is, yeah, running out of data is a uh, something that could that could really push back progress. But yeah, I mean that that's the other thing. Like you have to bet against these labs and these companies and these people working on this. And I mean these are like they're really investing a lot of money into this this is like one of the main things happening in humanity right now giant data centers and computer science like computer science for decades has been the it thing to study in in school if you want to like have a good job and like have like a flexible working life so it's going to continue that way like people want to work in computer science that's huge that means these real problems that might impede progress are going to have people working on them. I mean, what's the real problem in something that, yeah, it's. All right, so as an aside, this also means that we should expect more variance between the different labs in coming years compared to today. Up until recently, the state of the art techniques were published so everyone was basically doing the same thing. And new upstarts or open source projects could easily compete with the frontier since the recipe was published. Now key algorithmic ideas are becoming increasingly proprietary. I expect labs approaches to diverge much more and some to make faster progress than others. Even a lab that seems on the frontier now could get stuck on the data wall while others make a breakthrough that let them race ahead. And open source will have a much harder time competing. It will certainly make things interesting. And if and when a lab figures it out, their breakthrough will be the key to AGI, key to superintelligence, one of the United States most prized secrets. So yeah, that's another factor. Um, there's a competition. Um, from various uh, sectors around the globe. And um, there's incentive to be the first because once you have the, you, you know, like you can think of it like like a, a video game almost. Like, you know, what's it like to play a video game when you don't have a map of, of the game? It, it, it sucks. You're just, you're getting lost all the time. You can't find out what to do. You know, what if you, in Zelda, when you find the map and compass, you know, how does that change it? You, you finally have some direction, like, you know, other games, like when you have a direction for where to go and what to do, it, it makes the game a lot different. Um, so this is what people are trying to get when they secretly work on AGI. They want to be the first person with that map and compass where they're always doing the right thing while everyone else is, is fumbling in the dark. All right, unhobbling. Finally, the hardest to quantify, but no less important, category of in improvements. Uh, what I'll call unhobbling. And imagine, imagine what that means for militaries. I mean, military strategy. Like, you can win or lose a war just just on where you decide to set up your troops. So, like, you know your enemies doesn't have AGI, they set up in the south. You have AGI, you set up in the north. You know, you could win with the tenth of the troops they have because your uh, positioning is so much more strategic. Like, it's, it's just like, forget about it. The first person that has AI, AGI and, and uses it for super intelligence and uses it for military applications conquers the world because <laughs> they're always going to be steps and steps ahead. Imagine if when asked to solve a hard math problem, you had to instantly answer with the very first thing that came to mind. It seems obvious that you would have a hard time except for the simplest problems. But until recently, that's how we had LLMs solve math problems. 
Instead, most of us work through the problem step by step on a scratch pad and are able to solve the problem and are able to solve much more difficult problems that way. So, chain of thought prompting unlocked that for LLMs. Despite excellent raw capabilities, they were much worse at math than they could be because they were hobbled in an obvious way. It took a small algorithmic tweak to unlock much greater capabilities. So that, that makes sense. Um, let's say you, you are dealing with uh, another person. Let's say you are raising a child and you say, you have to get A's in school. Um, and the child's like, okay, well, I'm going to go to school and I'm going to get A's. Uh, they go to school, they get B's, and then you realize you didn't buy them a calculator. You didn't buy them pencils. You didn't buy them the things they need to do well in school. You buy that for them, and they go and do everything they were doing before, but now they have enough paper to write with. They have the the right calculator. They have a TI, you know, uh, scientific calculator, and they come back with A's even though – you know, they themselves didn't do anything different. They just now have everything they need to succeed. Or like imagine a tennis player um, with their one with one hand, you know, or a basketball player with one hand tied behind their back. You know, untie their hand. <laughs> They're going to be a much better player. There's Once we figure out how to do that with AGI or, or even with just the AI we have now, which is not quite AGI yet, um, there's going to be all kinds of improvements. And this was an example of that. When we ask it a math question, it's just going to tell you the first thing on its mind. But when we ask it to reason through a math question and use chain of reasoning techniques to solve it, it will do that. And that is a much more effective way of solving a math problem. We've made huge strides in un unhobbling models over the past few years. These are algorithmic improvements beyond just training better base models and often only use a fraction of pre-training compute that unleash model capabilities. Reinforcement learning from human feedback, RLHF. Base models have incredible latent capabilities. That's the magic of unsupervised learning in some sense. To better predict the next token, to make perplexity go down, models learn incredibly rich internal representations. Everything from famously sentiment to complex world models. But out of the box, they're hobbled. They're using their incredible internal representations merely to predict the next token in random internet text rather than applying them in the best way to actually try to solve your problem. But they're raw and incredibly hard to work with. While the popular conception of RLHF is that it merely censors swear words, RLHF has been key to making models actually useful and commercially valuable rather than making models predict random internet text, get them to actually apply their capabilities and try to answer your question. This was the magic of ChatGPT. Well done, RLHF made models usable and useful to real people for the first time. The original Instruct GPT paper has a great quantification of this. An RLHF small model was equivalent to a non RLHF greater than 100 times larger model in terms of human rater preference. So that's a good point, too. It doesn't even matter if the models themselves or the underlying technology grows and becomes orders of magnitude better you know if if we can apply something like reinforcement learning from human feedback without even changing the model at all we can build a much more useful product 
chain of thought. As discussed, chain of thought started being widely used just two years ago and can provide the equivalent of a greater than 10 times effective compute increase on math and reasoning problems. Scaffold. Think of chain of thought plus plus. Rather than just asking a model to solve a problem, have one model make a plan of attack, have another propose a bunch of possible solutions, have another critique it, and so on. For example, on human eval coding problems, simple scaffolding enables GPT 3.5 to outperform unscaffolding on GPT-4. On software engineering bench, a benchmark of solving real-world soft engineering tasks, GPT-4 can only solve around 2% correctly, while Devon's agent scaffolding, while with Devon's agent scaffolding, it jumps to 14 to 23%. Unlocking agency is only in its infancy though, as I'll discuss more later. Tools. Imagine if humans weren't allowed to use calculators or computers. We're only at the beginning here, but ChatGPT can now use a web browser, run some code, and so on. Context length. Models have gone from 2000 token context GPT-3 to 32,000 context GPT-4 release to 1 million plus context Gemini 1.5 Pro. This is a huge deal. A much smaller base model with say 1000 tokens of relevant context can outperform a model that is much larger but only has say 4000 relevant tokens of context more context is effectively a large compute efficiency gain. More generally, context is key to unlocking many applications of these models. For example, many coding applications require understanding large parts of a code base in order to usefully contribute new code, or if you're using a model to help you write a document at work, it really needs the context from lots of related internal docs and conversations. Gemini 1.5 Pro, with its 1 million plus token context, was even able to learn a new language, a low resource language, not on the internet, from scratch, just by putting a dictionary and grammar reference materials in context. Okay, and the footnote here, which ties to this, see figure 7 from the updated Gemini 1.5 white paper comparing perplexity versus context for Gemini 1.5 Pro and Gemini 1.5 Flash, a much cheaper and presumably smaller uh, model. Yeah, so like, so like we don't even know, like, you know, imagine, imagine your ESL, you know, your, your English as a second language and, and your, your strong native language is whatever. And then somebody has you take a test in, in English rather than your, your stronger native language. You know, how are you going to do on the test in English? Would you do as good? Um, you know, what if, what if it really was a, a much weaker language than, than your native language? You know, you, you probably wouldn't do as good at the test, even if it was the exact same test, but in uh, your weaker language uh, than you would do if it were in your stronger language. So, you know, maybe... Uh, these AIs are hobbled in that way. They have a native language and, and we're doing all of our prompting and, and everything of them in some sort of second language that's, that's not as, uh, as uh, that they're not as good with. You know? you know, what if we develop a way to prompt it where we uh, translate our, our prompts and feed it to it in its preferred native language you know, how much of a, of a improvement would that cause? And, and that wouldn't change anything with, with the algorithmic improvements, with the, um, with the uh, compute added, um, you know, anything like that. We're, we're just feeding the prompt in a, in a different, strange and mysterious way to us that is uh, easier for it to work with. 
Post-training improvements. The current GPT-4 has substantially improved compared to the original GPT-4 when released. According to John Schulman, due to post-training improvements that unlocked latent model capability on reasoning evals, it's made substantial gains. For example, it went from around 50% to 72% on math, which is a specialized benchmark test made for AIs to evaluate how well it can solve math problems to around 40% to 50% on GPQA, which is another specialized benchmark. I forget what it's uh, testing. It's okay. We don't have to dive into every detail. And on the LM Sys leaderboard, it's made nearly 100 point ELO jump comparable to the difference in ELO between Claude 3 Haiku and the much larger Claude 3 Opus models that have a 50 times price increase. So I don't need to know every little uh, detail of, uh, I forget what an ELO is. So uh, uh, yeah, let's we'll just move on. So I'm just having a surface level understanding of, of what the future might look like, I think is is important. All right, so a survey by Epoch AI have some of these techniques like scaffolding, tool use, and so on, finds that techniques like this can typically result in effective compute gains of five to 30 times on many benchmarks. METR, an organization that evaluates models, similarly found very large performance improvements on their set of agentic tasks via unhobbling from the same GPT-4 base model. So unhobbling is like a basketball player playing with one tied behind the back. You could just say, hey, you don't have to tie your hand, your hand behind your back. Untie it and use both hands. That would be an example of unhobbling a basketball player from 5% with just the base model to 20% with the GPT-4 as post-trained on release to nearly 40% today from better post-training tools and agent scaffolding, figure 16. So figure 16 is performance on METR. So this is an organization that evaluates models, uh, agentic tasks, uh, so this is evaluating uh, whether or not the AI can uh, perform things on its own without without a prompt. It can act as, as an agent over time via better unhobbling. And, and that's important that it's uh, improvement over time via better unhobbling because uh, that's aside from better compute, uh, more investment, uh, even even algorithmic gains. I mean, um, unhobbling is simply just using what it has better, uh, not necessarily uh, completing, completely rewriting new, uh, coming up with with new insights into the unlying, underlying science necessarily. Even. All right. So source model evaluation and threat resource. So here we have a grab bag of tasks um, and. Uh, how well it can complete them and then the or roughly the order of time so we're starting with the basic uh gpt4 base technology and we can see just a random grab bag of tasks uh that is trying to perform agentically on its own it can only do about five percent of the time um and then uh and then as time goes on uh we can see as as updates are are released to the basic underlying technologies um, it gets better and better and better. And then uh, that's the case as well with, with this green one here. Um, oh, yeah. So, so what we can see with the green one too is that even even the weaker model, uh, 3.5, uh, is going from 5% to, to 10% um, just through this unhobbling. So like this unhobbling, does, it doesn't matter that you know, this is part of that multifaceted uh, reason, you know, why this rate of growth is happening. You know, it doesn't even matter if we go from 3.5 to 3.4 to, to, to 4. 
you know, we don't need a chat, chat GPT four, five, and six. What we need is a chat GPT four that no longer plays basketball with one hand tied behind its back. If we can get that, then we don't need any advancement at all. And we're going to have an agent that's better at playing basketball. <laughs> While it's hard to put these on a unified, effective compute scale with uh, compute and algorithmic efficiencies, it's clear these are huge gains, at least on a roughly similar magnitude as the compute scale up and algorithmic efficiencies. It also highlights the central role of algorithmic progress. The around half OOMs per year of compute efficiencies already significant are only part of the story and put together with unhobbling algorithmic progress overall is maybe even a majority of the gains on the current trend. Unhobbling is a huge part of what actually enabled these models to become useful and I'd argue that much of what is holding back many commercial applications today is the need for further unhobbling of this sort. Today, models, how, indeed, models today are still incredibly hobbled. For example, they don't have long-term memory. <laughs> so you know, imagine playing someone in chess who doesn't have long-term memory and imagine them beating you and, and doing good. You know, this is where we're at with, uh, with these LLMs. I mean, well, honestly, when you try to play an LLM in chess, they, they don't do very well. Um, but, um, you know, it's um, <clears throat> having a long-term memory would, would change everything. Um, uh, they can't use a computer, so they they still only have very limited tools. Um, they they still mostly don't think before they speak. Um, when you ask ChatGPT to write an essay. It's like expecting a human to write an essay via their initial stream of computers. And, and not only that, they don't ruminate over what they've spoken. Uh, if you're like me, you do this excessively. Um, you say something or you're in some situation and you just can't get it out of your mind. You know, what happened during the situation, how you acted in the situation. You just think about it over and over and over again. Um, that's good when it comes to things like learning to play. You know, this is probably where this kind of a an insight I'm making right now. But where this comes from probably is is I I my first uh, career ambition was to become a uh, classical musician. So you know, you have to think about what was I playing in tune? Did I did I use the right articulation? You have to be ruminating over these little details a lot, even when you're not practicing throughout the day, if you want to make continual improvement. So, you know, I kind of apply that to uh, more things than it's due to be applied. But, you know, AIs don't do that at all. Like, imagine if they gave you an answer and then they really thought about the answer they gave you and later they can be like, hey, can we go back and, and discuss this this thing that happened? I, first of all, I want to apologize. I feel like I didn't handle that right. And uh, here's a way I can, you know, they don't have any of that. And, and to get that, they just need to be unhobbled. They don't need to be uh, fed new data. They don't need to be uh, fed more power in, with new data centers. They just need to be taught that. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, P and, and this this is this is the next big advancement. Uh, uh, they're going. They're working on um, having a a uh, ChatGPT, having a an AI, to have an internal mo monologue before they just blurt out to you the answer. They want to think carefully about what they say to you, the way most people do. And, and we know the people who don't. And, and, and look, look at the difference between the things they say and the people who really think carefully and deliberate about the things they say. You know, the, the difference in those, those answers are different. And that's not to say that you only want one or the other. Uh, or, or that's not to say that you only want careful deliberation and not any sort of, you know, impulsive, like, blurting out of answers. But right now, we only have... Uh, that uh, impulsive blurting out of answers 
and no internal deploration. So if, if we can just get a mix of both, um, that's going to change everything without any sort of other factor having to change. They can mostly only engage in short back and forth dialogues rather than going away for a day or a week, thinking about a problem, researching different approaches, consulting other humans, and then writing you a longer report or a pull request. I mean, yeah, imagine that they, they go away, they, uh, conf they uh, reach out, they send emails to other people around the globe and they say, this, this is the vision. Do you want to do this? Yes or no? okay, uh, can you do this? We need you to do this. Okay, you did it. And then, then they go report back to you and they, this is a check mark of everything we had. Here's your resources uh, around the globe that'll help you. Um, so it can't, it can't even come close to doing that now. Um, and uh, when it's two orders, you know, when it blows up from the size of a soccer ball to, to uh, the size of a ball, half a soccer stadium, um, it's certainly going to be able to do that and, and things we can't even imagine. They're mostly not personalized to you or your application, just a generic chatbot with a short prompt rather than having all the relevant background on your company and your work. The possibilities here are enormous and we're rapidly picking low hanging fruit here. This is crucial. It's completely wrong to just imagine <clears throat> GPT-6, chat GPT. Yeah, the, the, yeah, it's, it's so important to imagine. Because cause think about, you know, I, that, that soccer ball, I keep, I keep bringing it up because it's so important to understand how it's going to change things. You can't play soccer with a soccer ball the size of a 10-story building. You know, it, it, it's the same for, for the AI. It's not just going to be a, a chat program. Like you know it, it, it's different than than a a soccer ball obviously it, it, it's an application that that does things so you know there'll still be some sort of chat component to it but it's going to change to be completely unrecognizable to what it is today i mean look at look at a personal computer yeah so let's 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 look at this timeline of computer history which is happening at a much slower rate of progress than than um than what happens um than what's happening with ai uh so yeah so let's 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 go to to this decade here so this this stops at 2015 um so the apple watch you know you know what's the difference between the first apple watch and and what we have now uh if we go back to uh uh, the beginning of, of this decade, uh, you know, we had, we had a, uh, yeah, this was the beginning, you know, what is, what is the difference of, uh, yeah, so this, this is where, this is where IBM Watson could, could be Jeopardy contestants, you know, now, now it's beating a uh, Go contestants, um, this is the the original iPad was released. I mean, how how different is that to iPads today? But but then going back a decade before, um, in the year two thousand, this is when the game The Sims came out. This is when, um, PlayStation Two came out. I mean, that's that's a that's a really good one. The the, the difference in games. This is when uh you know USB flash drives didn't exist in the 90s like what'd you have to do you had to there was something called sneakerware you had to take take the disc out and and put the disc somewhere else like the internet itself didn't exist um y2k bug there, there was a the ability to print out a date didn't exist in the same way it does now like you know it's 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 mind-boggling how how different ai is going to be in 20 years from now in the year in the year 2045 you know because because if we look back in the year 2000 you know it's it's look at all these changes in something that's progressing at a slower rate okay so yeah, they're not. Uh, they're mostly not personalized to you or your application. They're uh, just a generic uh, chatbot 
with a uh, short prompt rather than having all the relevant background on your company and your work. The possibilities here are enormous and we're rapidly picking low hanging fruit here. This is critical. It's completely wrong to just imagine uh, ChatGPT, uh, GPT-6 ChatGPT with continued unhobbling progress. The improvements will be step changes compared to GPT-6 and RLHF. By 2027, rather than a chatbot, you're looking to have something that looks more like an agent or a coworker. And this is this is just the pure text too. Like you can integrate this with robotic form factors too. Imagine if your computer can hug you. You know, that would change so much about how people act online. Like one of the biggest problems we have online is like you know, people are just like really upset and mean online a lot of the times like Imagine if, like, there's a robotic thing that, like, can recognize you when you're getting really upset and say, hey, you need to take a break now. It, like, gives you a hug and, like, you know, kind of, like, rubs your shoulder and it's like, hey, you know, don't worry about it. You know, how different would you act on, a, on, like, a on, on like a forum or something like that if, if there were emotional intelligence built in to the way we interact with technology? Like, that, that is coming for sure. From chatbot to agent coworker, what could ambitious unhobbling over the coming years look like? The way I think about it, there are three key ingredients. Number one, solving the onboarding problem. GPT-4 has the raw smarts to do a decent chunk of many people's jobs, but it's sort of like a smart new hire that just showed up five minutes ago. It doesn't have any relevant context. It hasn't read the company docs or Slack history or had conversations with members of the team or spent any time understanding the company internal code base. A smart new hire isn't that useful five minutes after arriving, but they are quite useful a month in. Yep. It seems like it should be possible for example via very long context to onboard models like we would a new human coworker. This alone would be a huge unlock. All right, so number two, the test time compute overhang, reasoning slash error correction slash system two for longer horizon problems. And system two, I think what he's referring to there is uh, Daniel Kahneman. Um, uh, there, there's, there's been science uh, done on, on the brain and how, how, yeah, and reasoning, you know, error correction, ways of thinking. And um, the science has kind of uh, made a case that we think in two ways, system one and system two. System one, uh, we think based on all of our experiences and priors, and we think fast. We just do what we think is true um, as quickly as possible. System two is we rethink what is actually true and not, and we really do some deep uh, deliberation on, on, on what we think is true. And the difference between system one and system two is a trade-off in speed and accuracy system one is a lot faster but we're more likely to make a critical mistake because we haven't really thought through and carefully deliberated slowly on whether or not our action is right whether or not uh, our priors what we believe to true are actually true and thus we we take rapid fast action that is is more likely to be uh incorrect uh, on the other hand, system two, it takes us a while. We have to sleep on it. We have to do some study, do some research, but ultimately we're more likely to come up with a correct answer. So the way you can apply this in uh, real life is you go to the ice cream shop with some friends and they have a menu a mile wide. Use system one, get whatever, you, you, you know, don't take more than five to 10 seconds to order your ice cream. It just doesn't matter. You're buying a house. You're you're uh, uh, taking a job opportunity that's going to uh, affect the rest of your life. 
use system too. It'll take days. Sleep on it. Think very carefully. Uh, the, look at uh, some reports of the new area you might be looking into. Uh, th really think about about what that would mean if if your income increases. Let's say it increases five percent. But then your cost of living increases by 15%. You know, that's a bad deal. You're going to end up losing money for that deal. So if you just be like, you know, I'll take it or not, and an impulsive gut decision and follow your gut, you know, I would say when it comes to really big uh, decisions, uh, that's a, you got to slow down, you got to sleep on it, and you got to uh, do your homework on on what and, and come up with a, a you you have to use system two style thinking but when it comes to the here and now if you're kind of like i am and uh you probably uh don't use system two style thinking in the most appropriate ways and you kind of deliberate and and it takes you forever just to order something simple at a restaurant you, you stra oh, i should order the turkey oh why did i get the oh i knew this was going to be bad and i ordered it anyway it's like it, who cares it's it's not an impact now for your health if you're constantly ordering <laughs> bad food you, you know you need to have a plan for um for uh living healthfully um which will require some system two thinking but here and now in the moment if if you you know stress and you, everyone's like come on come on go faster why are you taking so long to do something this simple you, you got to get better at that uh, system one style thinking. That's, that's how I think about it. I, and I, I, it's, it's actually been really useful for me in life because I think I'm the kind of person that, 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 you know, before knowing about the difference between system one and system two style thinking, I think I would um, make decisions in, in less optimal ways. Uh, when it came to here and now decisions that didn't matter, I stressed and deliberated over them and ruminated on them too much when the outcome really just didn't matter. And then when it came for big decisions that required a lot of deliberation to really assess whether or not it, it does make sense for me to do, I just didn't give them the thought they were due. And, and I needed to think about them more carefully, sleep on it, get more data, more information to make a better decision. So I think I do a bit of a better job at that now, but that's kind of one of the main challenges in life. <laughs> All right, so right now, models can basically do only short tasks. You ask them a question and they give you an answer, but it's extremely limiting. Most cognitive work humans do is longer horizon. It doesn't take just five minutes, but hours, days, weeks, or months. A scientist that could only think about a difficult problem for five minutes couldn't make any scientific breakthroughs. A software engineer that could only write skeleton code for a single function when asked couldn't be very useful. Software engineers are given a larger task and then they go make a plan, understand relevant parts of the code base, or technical tools, write different modules and test them incrementally, debug errors, search over the space of possible solutions, and eventually submit a large pull request. That's the culmination of weeks of work and so on. Okay, so um, one final thing I have to say about all this is, you know, there's something called weird uh, uh, bias. Um, which which is important to point out a lot of there's a little bit of a um there's a little bit of a um replication crisis in some of these studies uh so the, it needs a little bit of a grain of salt but but honestly that works towards the advantage of ai progress because you know what if we we learn more about the difference between system one and system two thinking we learn that that's just not actually a real concept and 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 we learn what actually is true about what makes for productive thought patterns and behaviors it's unhobbled you know that was a hobbling this whole idea of of, of system one or two so i just wanted to add uh you know in there to uh um that that, that the truth is always more uh sophisticated um and uh, one of the reasons that uh, these are these are a little bit um, 
requires a little bit of skeptic sometimes is that uh, uh, there's a lack of diversity in research. So you're not testing everyone around the globe. You're testing people very specific to very specific cultures. So you're going to get very specific um, outcomes that'll vary grateful, greatly um, in the context of uh, global human behavior. So you'll just get findings that just don't apply to other parts of even the very same local area you're in um, if you go outside the walls of the university. Um, but again, th that probably works towards the advantage of, of uh, AI because that's a hobbling. You know, the moment you come overcome that hobbling and you get the real truth is the moment that your AI works better. Okay, so technical tools, write different modules and test them incrementally, debug errors, search over the space of possible solutions and eventually submit a large pull request. That's the culmination of weeks of work and so on. In instance, there is a large test time computing overhang. Think of each GPT-4 token as a word of internal monologue when you think about a problem. Each GPT-4 token is quite smart, but it can currently only really effectively use on the order of around hundreds of tokens for chains of thought coherently, effectively as though you could only spend a few minutes of internal monologue slash thinking on a problem or project. What if it could use millions of tokens to think about and work on the really hard problems for bigger projects? All right, so the number of tokens and then equivalent to me, uh, meaning uh, Leopold Ashenbrenner, the valedictorian of Columbia, <laughs> working on something for uh, a few minutes. For me, it's probably <laughs> one token. Um, so, uh, you know, for, for, for him to work on something for a few minutes and for ChatGPT to work on the same thing um, and to get similar progress, you would have to feed uh, ChatGPT uh, 100 tokens. Um, for him to work on something for half an hour, um, yeah. So, so I, I guess, I guess the point of this is, is we can see the the scaling. We, we, the, these tokens have to be scaled up, but um, yeah. So, I guess by twenty twenty seven, I mean this is pretty significant. Like half a work day. Oh, auto power off. I have to. Hit a button on my headphones. Uh, yeah, I guess I'm not sure what to make about this, so let's read the caption. Assuming a human thinking at around 100 tokens per minute and working at 40 hours a week translates a week, translating how long a model thinks in tokens to human time on a given uh, problem slash uh, project. So after a two order of magnitude increase, um, you know, by 2027, uh, this should happen. Uh, the GPTs will be smart enough that um, somebody, you know, like uh, Leopold Ashenbrenner, and, th and this this isn't arrogance here. You know, this is uh, he graduated valedictorian. He's worked for you know one of the most significant companies out there. Uh, He's starting his own company. You know, he probably gets a lot done in, in half a work day. So to be able to, like, simulate the work he does, even for just a half a day, that's, uh, you know, you know, by the time we get to, we can just have a robot do the equivalent work he would do uh, after a year. You know, that's, that's where, where we, we've aligned AI. You know, that's what he was working on was was – aligning AI like you know that's done all right so even if the per token intelligence were the same it'd be the difference between a smart person f spending a few minutes versus a few months on a problem and a person like me spending <laughs> a few months versus spending 50 hours I don't know about you, but there's much, much, much more capable 
Uh, I don't know about you, but that's much, much, much more capable. Oh, I, I keep, for some reason, my brain is skipping these two words. So let's uh, read it again and include these two words. I don't know about you, but theirs. So that that's where, that's where I was missing up. I read this as that's rather than theirs. I don't know about you, but there is much, much, much more I am capable of in a few months versus a few minutes. Yep. If we could unlock being able to think and work on something for months equivalent rather than a few minutes equivalent for models, it would be unlock an insane jump in capability. There's a huge overhang here, many OOMs worth. So yeah, when you go to ChatGPT, hey, how are you? You know, it responds in real time. You know, imagine if you if you say, hey, how are you? It thinks about it and says, hold on, let me get back to you. Okay, well, I'm okay because I'm uh, working on this, but these aren't going well. This, You know, you know, it can give a much introspection. It's, it's lacking introspection, and introspection can be added without any sort of other advancement. Um compute uh data uh and and it would unlock capability it's the multi-faceted multi-factorial uh uh robust uh growing in capability that doesn't just depend on one thing going right and continuing to go right if we hit the data wall well it's the these unhobbling effects will continue the growth yeah so if we could uh I don't know about you, but there's, yep, but there's much, much, much more I am capable of in a few months versus a few minutes. If we could unlock being able to think and work on something for months equivalent rather than a few months equivalent for models, it would unlock an insane jump in capability. There's a huge overhang here, many orders of magnitude worth. So, so this is another reason why we can't imagine, you know, our most optimistic estimates for how this will uh increase over time might be vastly under you know estimated because we unlock something like this you know it jumps up many orders of magnitude and when i say we i i don't mean me right now models can't do this yet even with recent advances in long context, this longer context mostly only works for the consumption of tokens, not the production of tokens. After a while, the model goes off the rails or gets stuck. It's not yet able to go away for a while to work on a problem or project on its own. Which makes sense. Why would it have learned the skills for longer horizon reasoning and error correction? There's very little data on the internet in the form of my complete internal monologue reasoning and all relevant steps over the course of a month as I work on the project. Unlocking this capability will require a new kind of training for it to learn these extra skills, or as Gwern put it, private correspondence. Brain the size of a galaxy, and what do they ask me to do? Predict the misspelled answers on benchmarks. Marvin the depressed neural network moaned. All right, so, but unlocking and Gorn is another uh, figure in this space. Uh, it's a blog, Gorn.net. So it's a, kind of a person similar to the author here that writes uh, his own stuff. So he writes about AI psychology and statistics. All right, so getting back to it. But unlocking time test 
but unlocking test time compute might merely be a matter of relatively small unhobbling algorithmic wins. Perhaps a small amount of RL, which stands for... I don't know. Um... All right, I'm not sure what RL stands for, but it's probably has to do with this internal dialogue. So p perhaps a small amount of like internal dialogue helps a model learn to error correct. Hmm, that doesn't look right. Let me double check that. You know, and that happens all completely uh, within someone's mind. Um, so it's easy for the model to get the wrong idea that that nobody does that because nobody explicitly writes out all of their internal dialogue. It, it's probably not even possible. A lot of internal dialogue happens uh, through pictures, happens through uh, kind of gut feeling. It, it, it do, it's not a verbal internal dialogue. It's a multimedia in, in, internal dialogue for most people. Make plans, search over possible solutions, and so on. In a sense, the model already has most of the raw capabilities. It just needs to learn a few extra skills on top to put it all together. In essence, we just need to teach the model a sort of system to outer loop. That helps it reason through difficult long horizon projects. So system one, yeah, so he, he, this, the author will explain what this means. System one versus system two is a useful way of thinking about current capabilities of LLMs, including their limitations and dumb mistakes. And what might be possible with RL and unhobbling? Think of it this way. When you are driving, most of the time you are on autopilot. System one what models mostly do right now. And when you encounter a complex construction zone or a novel intersection, you might ask your passenger seat companion to pause your conversation for a moment while you figure out, actually think about what's going on and what to do. If you were forced to go about life with only system one closer to models today, you'd have a lot of trouble. Creating the ability for system two reasoning loops is a central unlock. If we succeed at teaching this outer loop, instead of a short chatbot answer to a couple paragraphs, imagine a stream of millions of words coming in more quickly than you can read them. As the model thinks through problems, uses tools, tries different approaches, does research, revises its work, coordinates with others, and completes a uh, big projects on its own and imagine different kinds of internal reasonings as I mentioned as well what if it can draw a diagram on a whiteboard what if it can show you you know if it can do this sort of internal, internal deliberation using uh, scaffolding tools of thought using uh, special chain of reasoning uh, techniques you know I, I've like you can't have an internal dialogue in, in a human brain where you write on a on a whiteboard and exactly visualize writing on a whiteboard where you use an actual calculator um where you use an actual tool you know you just you just think about it and you have these intuitions based on your prior experiences you're not doing real time here and now work um that's part of your internal stream of consciousness you're not using your hands in the physical world in your internal deliberations an ai i think could do that it, it could um i think it, you know it, as part of its internal deliberations it could it could do a project especially if it came away you know after a a uh, few weeks or a few months you know you ask it some unsolvable problem it uh sends emails to people all, all around the world it does some research on it and it gives you the answer all right so um, so, you know, it, it serves as like an administrator, an orchestrator to get uh, people to do things. All right. So if we succeed in teaching this 
outer loop instead of a short chat chat bot answer to a couple paragraphs. Imagine a stream of millions of words coming in more quickly than you can read them. As the model thinks through problems, uses tools, tries different approaches, does research, revises its work, coordinates with others, and completes big projects on its own. Trading off test time and train time compute in other machine learning domains. In other domains, like AI systems for board games, it's been demonstrated that you can use more test time compute, also called interference time compute, to substitute for training compute. So figure 18 here, um, Jones uh, 2021, a smaller model can do as well as a much larger model at the game of hex. If you give it more test time compute, more time to think. In this domain, they find that one can spend around 1.5 orders of magnitude more compute at test time to get performance equivalent to a model with uh, around one OOMs more training compute. And, and imagine if it could cache its its internal deliberations. Like, oh, you're asking about something I've already thought about. Um, I can use this pre-existing internal deliberation now to answer your question more immediately. You know, that that's an unhobbling as well. And that's something humans can't do. You can't, I mean, maybe you can, like if it's, if it's in your memory, but... Um, you know, imagine being able to do that faster with more uh, power. All right, so uh, the test time compute flops per second as that increases logarithmically. Um, the uh, train time uh, flops per second uh, decreases. Or uh, uh, so no, sorry. As the as the train time compute flops per second increases. Um, the the test time uh, now increases, or sorry, now decreases. Now it decreases. The trade off between train time compute and test time compute. Each dotted line gives the minimum train compute, uh, train test compute required for a certain ELO on a nine by nine board. So yeah, I don't have to get super down in the weeds uh, here. Um, the the goal is just to get a you know situational awareness, get to get a sense of what the next ten years is going to look like, not to become a <laughs> world class leading AI researcher. That would uh, take uh, a lot more time. That would take more tokens than I have. If a similar uh, relationship held in our case, we could unlock. Uh, over four orders of magnitude of test time compute, that might be equivalent to over three orders of magnitude of pre-training compute. For example, very roughly something like the jump between uh, GPT-3 and GPT-4, solving this unhobbling would be equivalent to a huge order of magnitude scale up. Using a computer. This is perhaps the most straightforward of the three. Chat GPT right now is basically like a human that sits in an isolated box that you can text. While early unhobbling improvements teach models to use individual isolated tools, I expect that with multimodal models, we will soon be able to do this in one fell swoop. We will simply enable models to use a computer like a human would. That means joining your Zoom calls, researching things online, and and then contributing to them to group conversations, like orchestrating, leading. Like wow, researching things online, uh, messaging and emailing people, reading shared docs, using your apps and dev tooling, and so on. Of course, for models to make the most use of this in longer horizon loops. This will go hand in hand with unlocking test time compute. By the end of this, I expect us to get something that looks a lot like a drop in remote worker. An agent that joins your company is onboarded like a new human hire, messages you and colleagues on Slack and uses your softwares, makes pull requests and that given big projects can do the model equivalent of a human going away for uh, weeks to independently complete the project. 
You'll probably need somewhat better base models than GPT-4 to unlock this, but possibly not even that much better. A lot of juice is in fixing the clear and basic ways that models are still hobbled. A very early peek at what this might look like is Devon, an early prototype of unlocking the agency overhang, test time compute overhang on models on the path to creating a fully automated software engineer. I don't know how well Devon works in practice, but this demo is still very limited compared to what proper chatbot uh, to agent unhobbling would uh, yield. It's a useful teaser in the sort of thing coming. So this is another thing that we can't even really imagine right now. Uh, we have some glimpse into it with uh, this Devon uh, demo, um, but even that is not a uh, unhobbling of the AI so that it, it, it's no longer serving the role as a chatbot and now it's serving the role as a complete agent. Once we can teach the AI to uh, kind of view itself in a different light and, and be uh, able to act in ways that uh, for whatever reason it was not uh, deciding to act, that will uh, greatly increase uh, what it's able to do. By the way, the centrality of unhobbling might lead to a somewhat interesting sonic boom effect in terms of commercial applications. Intermediate models between now and the drop-in remote worker will require tons of schlep <laughs> to uh, change workflows and build infrastructure to... Um, integrate and derive economic value from so schlep I, I think that just stands for like hard work yeah so like yeah the drop-in remote worker will be dramatically easier to integrate just well drop them in to automate all the jobs that could be done remotely it seems plausible that the schlep the hard work will take longer than the unhobbling that is by the time the drop-in remote worker is able to automate a large number of jobs, intermediate models won't yet have been fully harnessed and integrated. So the jump in economic value generated could be somewhat discontinuous. The next four years, putting the numbers together, we should roughly expect another GPT-2 to GPT-4 sized jump in the four years following gpt for by the end of 2027. And remember, this is a GPT-2 size to jump to TPP-4. So this is a difference between not being able to form coherent sentences to acting like ChatGPT. GPT-2 to GPT-4 was roughly a 4.5 to 6 order of magnitude base effective compute scale up. Uh, physical compute and algorithmic efficiencies, plus major unhobbling gains from base model to chatbot. In the subsequent four years, we should expect three to six OMs of base effective compute scale up, uh, physical compute algorithmic efficiencies, with perhaps a best guess of around five OMs, plus steep changes in utility and applications unlocked by unhobbling from chatbot to agent drop-in uh, remote worker. To put this in perspective, suppose ChatGPT4 training took three months. In 2027, a leading AI lab will be able to train a ChatGPT4 level model in a minute. One of the best, uh, wow, one of the best assumptions on physical compute and algorithmic efficiency scale-ups described above and simplifying parallelism considerations. In reality, it might look more like 1,440, um, 60 times 24 GPT-4 level models in a day or similar. The OOM effective compute scale-up will be dramatic. 
Well, where will that take us? All right, so we got some graphics here. Let's uh, read those over. So now remember, we're talking about dash two to dash four. So the differences in that were enormous. That happened in five years. So uh, it looks like we've got here um, compute, algorithmic efficiency, and unhobbling. So the difference between two and four in compute was uh, at most uh, four OOMs. Uh, the difference uh, when it comes to compute, um, when it comes to algorithmic efficiency, it was at most two. And when it comes to an unhobbling, it's, it's harder to predict, but it, it's uh, probably around two. Um, so uh, RLHF, uh, chain of thought scaffolding tools, uh, uh, et cetera, are some examples of, of unhobbling advancements, which are different from algorithmic efficiency. If, if these two things stop, this will still go. Uh, so it's a multifaceted uh, growth. All right, so altogether, uh, the uh, compute and the algorithmic efficiency is increasing at once, uh, even though each is is uh, its own order of magnitude when you add them up together. Uh, potentially, it could be six orders of magnitude of base scale up. Um, and, and remember what uh, we were talking about with the soccer ball growing from just a soccer ball on the field to taking up half the field. That was only two orders of magnitude. So when we're up to six orders of magnitude, um, y you know, that that's um, um, so one order of magnitude from um, 30 centimeters is 300. Two is 3000. Uh, three, four, five, six. Now we're at something three million centimeters. Uh, so now we have we have a uh, 186 mile uh, in diameter uh, soccer ball. Um, so uh, planet Earth uh, diameter. In miles, we're not quite no, we're not quite to uh, Earth size, planetary size. Uh, let's see. Now the Moon is a lot smaller. So, well, it's not a ton. It's not an order orders of magnitude smaller or larger. Um, it's uh, it's three three point. It's th it's, it's it's about two thousand. So. Um, one more uh once we get to seven uh orders of magnitude uh higher we're in the ballpark of uh moon size we're still quite a bit smaller than the moon but uh once we get to eight orders of magnitude now we're way larger than the moon so i think it's fair to say that if you blow up the soccer ball um to seven orders of magnitude it's now the size of the moon like imagine that and, and that might be a little bit of a further ways off, but, you know, having it be the size of half the soccer ball stadium, um, that'll be 2027. Um, the size of the moon might be further off, but, you know, the difference between a, a soccer ball and, and the size of the moon, it, it's, you can't even predict, you know, this, this idea of a drop-in remote worker. No, that it, it's it's simplistic. It's 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 too. It's not like maybe maybe by the time it uh, you know gets to two orders of magnitude, but but by the time it's seven orders of magnitude, it goes from the size of a soccer ball to the size of the moon. No, it, it's that that's gonna be that's a laughable uh, you know prediction for what it will act like. It, it it'll be unimaginable how it will look in the future. All right, so 2023 to 2027 projection. Um, yeah, so so this this is this is what the past looked like. Uh, 2019 to 2024, just a five year gain. Um, there was uh, six orders of magnitude base scale up. If that were seven, it would be like a soccer ball growing to the size of the moon. <laughs> uh, 2023 to to 27. Um, uh, it could be could be up to six if it were seven. Again, it would be uh, 
<laughs> it would be a lot. It's, it's not going to be seven best guess around uh, five um, by 2027. But remember, this this is this is the scaling up of the compute and the algorithmic efficiency. Um, so that also includes the unhobbling. Um, so when it comes to the overall scale up, um, you know, it, it might it might be different because remember when we make that moon analogy um, from the soccer ball growing to the size of the moon, we're assuming the soccer ball is of a certain size. And, and, and we're having the soccer ball represent something. So it could be that commute is a golf ball. It could be that um, algorithm efficiency is a little tiny bead. You know, that, that looks a lot different. For, a, for something one centimeter uh, across to grow, uh, you know, seven orders of magnitude, it's not going to blow up to the size of a balloon. So um, these, these pieces of the puzzle blowing up by several orders of magnitude um, wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily mean that the whole blows up by the same amount. All right, so figure 17, summary of the estimates on drivers of progress in the next four years preceding GPT-4 and what we should expect in the four years following GPT-4. But the point is that you it's whack-a-mole. You can't shut down all of them. They're, they're all going to continue to grow, which is going to contribute to the overall growth in a way that is impossible to shut down. Okay, so where will that take us, counting the OOMs? So all together, um, the, uh, uh, in 2019, we had ChatGPT 2. Um, so by 2027, we'll have whatever we have. It won't be ChatGPT 4. Um, and it will be capable of an automated uh, AI researcher engineer, uh, possibly. So figure 20 summary of counting the OOM. So th yeah, so this is a way to think about it. Um, this, this is uh, really a, a scientifically sound way to think about how this is growing. And it makes it really kind of undeniable and unquestionable that it is growing, that it is growing at a rate that is kind of unmentionable and uncomparable to the way other things have grown uh, in the past. Um, so, uh, yeah. So GPT-2 to GPT-4 took us from about a preschooler to about a smart high schooler from barely being able to output a few cohesive sentences to acing high school exams and being a useful coding assistant. That was an insane jump. If this is the intelligence gap we'll cover once more, where will that take us? We should not be surprised if it takes us very, very far. Likely it will take us to models that can outperform PhDs and the best experts in the field. Of course, any benchmark we have today will be saturated, but that's not saying much. It's mostly a reflection on the difficulty of making hard enough benchmarks. Yeah, and that that's important too. There's going to be a point where we can't even measure, you know, where it's at. It, it's 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 going to it's going to be smarter than us. We're making something smarter than us. We're we're making something that will have the same sort of. Um, relationship with us as we have to gorillas <laughs> you know we uh, one of the prominent preeminent scientists jane goodall taught a chimp to use sign language but the chimp couldn't read and write the chimp couldn't drive a car that's what we're going to be like to these ais in a few years you know, we might be like that by the year 2027 in compared to these AIs. And even now, you know, a smart high schooler, you know, what's that compared to a dumb high schooler? What's that compared to an average or dumb adult? Like, I'm, I'm sure like a lot of people will look at their honor high school student, the valedictorian of the class, who are themselves adults, maybe a parent of that kid or like know that kid and, and would be able to honestly say that kid is smarter than me you know it's it's not it's not operating at a low level 
to be a smart high schooler. <laughs> All right, so we should not be surprised if that takes us very, very far. Likely will take us to models that can outperform PhDs and the best experts in the field. One neat way to think about this is that the current trend of AI progress is proceeding at roughly three times the pace of child development. Your three time speed child just graduated from high school. It'll be taking your job before you know it. Again, critically, don't just imagine an incredibly smart chat GPT. Right. On hobbling games, yeah, it's it's hobbled. Being a chat program is incredibly limiting. It doesn't have hands, doesn't have feet. You know, it can go into form factors. It, it can be downloaded and installed into robots. Like, you know, and, and it would be unhobbled. It would have a physical form. Not having a physical form is an incredible hobbling. I mean, it, there's so much you can learn in, in the world by, by touching it. Unhobbling games should mean that this looks more like a drop-in remote worker, an incredibly smart agent that can reason and plan and error correct and knows everything about you and your company and can work on a problem independently for weeks. We are on course for AGI by 2027. These AI systems will basically be able to Automate basically all cognitive jobs. Think all jobs that could be done remotely. To be clear, the error bars are large. Progress could stall as we run out of data. If the algorithmic breakthroughs are necessary to crash through the data wall, prove harder than expected, maybe unhobbling doesn't go so far as we are stuck with merely expert chatbots rather than expert workers. Perhaps the decade-long trend lines break or scaling deep learning hits a wall for real this time. Or an algorithmic breakthrough, even simple on hobbling that unleashes the test time compute overhang, could be a paradigm shift accelerating things further and leading AGI even uh, earlier. And one thing I want to say, too, is you might be tempted to read this and say, oh, well, being a remote worker is, is your job's going to get replaced. There's no future for remote workers. Well, it, everything's going to change. Like, like the money's going to change. Like, like all of society will change when there's an entity on the planet that, that treats us as if we were gorillas you know, where we can't even have meaningful interactions with it. We can't do any, nearly any of the things that it can do. Um, I mean, you can even think of the difference between you and the smartest person you know. Like, you have completely different lifestyles. The smartest person you know is probably busy at work, probably has, like, a, a better living situation than you do, uh, a better upbringing and Sometimes it's hard to relate to the smartest person you know because they, they don't think about the same things you do. Um, you know, it's going to be that, but to the point where the smartest person you know is is just, like, you can't even, they, they don't even, it's, you know, you're a gorilla. <laughs> they might be nice and teach you some sign language, but... Mostly they're just going to be harvesting your environment for palm oil. All right. So let's see here. So perhaps. Uh, so to be clear, the error bars are large. Progress could stall as we run out of data. If the algorithmic breakthroughs necessary to crash through the data will prove harder than expected. Maybe on hobbling doesn't go as far. And we are stuck with merely expert chatbots rather than expert workers. Perhaps the decade-long trend lines break or deep learning hits a wall for real this time. Or an algorithmic breakthrough, even simple on hobbling, that unleashes the test time compute over hey, Could be a paradigm shift accelerating things further and leading to AGI even earlier. 
In any case, we are racing through the orders of magnitude, and it requires no esoteric beliefs, merely trend extra uh, polation of extrapolation, extrapolation of straight lines to take the possibility of AGI, a true AGI, by 2027 extremely seriously. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is where the author kind of loses me because it's like, you know, if, if the soccer ball grows from the size of a soccer ball to the size of the moon, does that mean it's going to turn into a basketball? Like, you know, AGI is something else than whatever this is, right? Like, why is it going to become an AGI? It seems like many are in the game of downward defining AGI these days as just as really good chatbot or whatever. What I mean is an AI system that could fully automate my or my friend's job or could fully do the work of an AI researcher or engineer. Perhaps some areas like robotics might take longer to figure out by default. And the societal rollout, uh, for example, in medical or legal professions could easily be slowed by societal choices or regulation. But once models can automate AI research itself, that's enough, enough to kick off intense feedback loops and could very quickly make for the progress the automated AI engineers themselves solving all the remaining bottlenecks to f fully automating everything. In particular, millions of automated researchers could very plausibly compress a decade of further algorithmic progress into a year or less. AGI will merely be a small taste of superintelligence soon to follow. More on that in the next uh, chapter. In any case, do not expect the... Uh, uh, sometimes the author uses unnecessary words. Um, just just use... Yeah, I mean, this is, this is like a... Meant to be uh, read by researchers, probably. So it's uh, vertiginous. Yeah, I, I didn't know that word. So this is... Okay, so he's just saying it, it's, it's like mind-boggling. It's happening so fast that it's disrupting your orientation of the world and causing uh, vertigo, which is a condition where your inner ear can't keep the balance. So if you have vertigo, like you're really at risk for falling down and injuring yourself. So uh, vertigo is a pretty serious condition. Yeah, so sensation of worrying and loss of balance associated particularly with looking down from a great height or caused by disease affecting the inner ear. Yeah, everyone's experienced vertigo, I'm sure. It's just where you feel, uh, um, you know, you have, you have to sit down. You, you, you have to be careful not to fall over if you have uh, vertigo. Um, so... So, in any case, do not expect a vertiginous space of progress to abate. The trend lines look innocent, but their implications are intense. As with every generation before them, every new generation of models will, be, will dumbfound most onlookers. They'll be incredulous when, very soon, Models solve incredibly difficult science problems that would take PhDs days when they're whizzing around your computer doing your job, when they're writing code bases with millions of lines of code from scratch, when every year or two the economic value generated by these models 10x's. And that's, that's what, uh, these, what is meant by the orders of magnitude. Um, every time there's an order of magnitude increase, it increases by 10. So the soccer ball goes from 30 uh, centimeters to 300 to 3,000 to um, uh, 30,000 to 300,000. And then once it's at 3 million, it's the size of the moon. Forget uh, sci-fi. Count the OOMs. That's what we should expect. AGI is no longer a distant fantasy. Scaling up simple deep learning techniques has just worked the models just want to learn 
and we're about to do another 100,000 times plus by the end of 2027. It won't be long before they're smarter than us. So, yeah, so these, these are not real people. These are not real people here. GPT-4 is just the beginning. Where will we be four years later? Do not make the mistake of underestimating the the rapid pace of deep learning progress as illustrated by progress in GANs, generative adversarial uh, networks. So we can see in 2004, uh, assuming that's what this is, I can't, um, I can't really tell uh, because there's no caption, but I'm assuming what this is is a generated face by, by AI. So in 2017, that's all you could do. You can't get the hair in there. They're not smiling and showing their teeth. You're not getting the ear. It's not even in color. 2015, that looks more like uh, somebody that, that is identifiable as a real person. You'd see that person on the street, and then you'd say, oh, this is a picture of that person I saw on the street. Um, now you don't see their ears, uh, their teeth. It's a very blurry picture. It's hard to see their, their teeth. Uh, you can't see clearly their teeth. Um, and then you're seeing a really zoomed in uh, part of the picture. 2016, we got more detail. We've got uh, wrinkles on the face. We've got a more pronounced jawline. Uh, we've got more of the hair. We can start to see some of their ears. Now they have their mouth closed. We can't see their teeth. Uh, teeth, uh, as anyone who's played around with this knows, we know that it gets hands very wrong. It's, it gets uh, teeth very wrong. It's still really bad at some things. 2018, now we, we have somebody that if this were a real person, this would be an obvious picture of that person. And it kind of looks like the soccer player, uh, David, uh, Beckham. I'm actually not, um, a <laughs> soccer fan. I just keep uh, bringing it up because it, uh, demonstrates the point. But my, my knowledge of soccer is very limited, but there we go. We have the hair, we have the, um, facial proportions we can see in the 2016 one um the left side of her face uh so the right side of the picture is is uh asymmetrical it, it kind of looks a little bit off um this one good facial symmetry we see the ears we see everything um now we see a little bit of a a mess up in 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 this part of the mouth that's kind of a little bit of a giveaway and then we also see the background makes no sense. There's like this weird blurring. There, there's nothing in the background that looks like it's a real picture. And that brings us to 2018, um, which is six years ago from the time of this video. Teeth are perfect. Ears are good. We've got a background. This is taken outdoors. Um, every, you know, this could be a picture of a real person. They're, they're, it's basically indistinguishable. From a real picture maybe maybe some of the shadowing um is really off the lighting but you know the way people take pictures they use artificial lighting so maybe you could get lighting that way um you know it's um and and this was a long long time ago so uh let's let's see what we got today draw a picture of a human face Yeah, and there's also a site called This Is Not A Real Person. Yeah, so, you know, this is... Um, okay, well, it's just drawing a cartoon there. But, yeah, so this is this is the same thing. And, and we can, um, you know, make it a, uh, uh, you know... Uh, uh, you know, we can toggle the parameters. Um, you know, this, 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 it's indistinguishable from a real person. Maybe the teeth are a little bit messed up. Um, that could be a giveaway. The earring also, I think is a big giveaway. It looks like it's a, uh, water drop kind of going down from the ear. It doesn't look like a real earring, but, um, and, and we don't know what uh, we don't know what this AI model is. It could be uh, out of date.
All right, so let's see here. So now we're, what we're going to do is continue uh, with the next page. I might I might have to hang it up at some point. I'm usually only good for an hour. Uh, I'm at the two-hour mark. I feel I feel like this is a very natural. Oh well, we could get down here. Uh, let's get down there. That's well. You know what? It t it typically takes a, a bit of time to get through each page, so just to get through the rest of these is probably. Now nah, let's let's do it. Let's do it. Let's let's get there. All right. So addendum. Racing through the OOMs. It's this decade or bust. I used to be more skeptical of short timelines to AGI. One reason is that it seemed unreasonable to privilege this decade, concentrating so much AGI probability mass on it. It seemed like the classic fallacy to think, oh, we're so special. Yeah, especially when you consider we don't have the advancements today. We're, we're stumbling around in the dark. I thought we should be uncertain about what it takes to get AGI, which should lead to a much more smeared out probability distribution over when we might get AGI. However, I've changed my mind. Critically, our uncertainty over what it takes to get AGI should be over OOMs of effective compute rather than over years. We're racing through the OOMs this decade. Even at its bygone heyday, Moore's Law was only 1 to 1.5 OOMs per decade. I estimate, <laughs> wow, that we will do uh, about 5 OOMs in 4 years and over 10 this decade of wool. So over 10, we're scaling up the soccer ball to the size of the moon. And in fact, over 10, to the weight, weight it's probably to the size of the sun, to be honest. So... That would be so. The size of the moon is is um, seven, so eight, nine, ten um, to uh, miles. Uh, so that that's um, maybe like uh, two hundred thousand miles. Uh, nope, not quite the size of the, of the sun, about, about a fourth the size of the sun, which is, which is insane. Cause the, the, you know, how many moons fit in the sun? Sixty four million moons fit in the sun. So, so we're going to, um, you know, 64 divided by four. Uh, which should be an easy calculation. I could just do it in my head. Yeah, sixteen. Uh, so we're gonna we're gonna we're going to scale it up from a soccer ball to potentially sixteen million moons. Like it's it's insane, and we're going to do that potentially with by twenty thirty five. Like, yeah. All right, so figure 22. Rough, rough projections on effective compute scale-up. We've been racing through the OOMs this decade. After the early 2030s, we will face a slow slog. Okay, so he's just kind of putting in a slow slog somewhere. This decade or bust. Effective compute normalized. And one thing you got to understand about the slow slog as well is it might not be a slog in growth. It might be a slog in our ability to understand and measure and calculate the growth, you know, because imagine that difference between a gorilla and, and a human. The more a human is like a gorilla, you know, the more the gorilla can understand this gorilla is faster than me. This gorilla is bigger than me. This gorilla um, has more, you know, mating opportunities than me. 
But then the more it becomes like a human, the gorilla can't even understand, you know, this human got here and is observing me because the human drove a car. You know, th this human is, is observing me because they're a, a student at a university and they're doing a research project with their professor. The, the student's going to be here with a team of people. You know, it, it, it's we're going to get to that point and that might look like a slog that might look like progress isn't happening but what's actually happening is the ability for us to detect progress is is, is it, it, that stopped you know now now we just see a another kind of gorilla looking thing that looks really weird just kind of sitting in the bushes and looking at us and like we, we can't really tell anything about it like we can tell it, it do, no longer has you know, in fact, it may even look worse because now this this other weird gorilla thing looking at us through these weird binoculars and stuff. It it you know we couldn't we can destroy it in a fight, like it's not taking our mating. You know, it it, it does it has no mating opportunities with with the other gorillas anymore. So you know, it might even look like it's it's doing worse, but it's just getting to the point where it's so much more sophisticated and intelligence that we are that we can't even imagine you know what it's doing maybe we can learn a little bit of sign language from it but we'll never learn to read and write we'll never learn to drive a car um we might be able to be in some movies with it you know like chimps are in movies with humans and we might be able to kind of play along and do some things but you know we're never going to be able to write and direct the movie we're never going to be able to um get the same kind of pay and equitable treatment as a human would i mean why would you pay animals starring in your movie the same you would you would pay the the movie star you know why would you write out a check to to the animal itself like you would write out a check to the entities that are handling the animals you know you know that's what it's going to look like in essence we're in the middle of a huge scale up uh, reaping one-time gains this decade and progress through the OOMs will be multiples slower thereafter but again you know it, it might not be it might be just our ability to detect the progress will be multiples slower if this scale up doesn't get us to AGI in the next five to ten years it might be a long way out Sp spending scale up spending a million dollars on a model used to be outrageous by the end of the decade we will likely have 100 billion or 1 trillion clusters going much higher than that will be hard it's already basically the feasible limit both in terms of what big business can afford and even just as a fraction of GDP thereafter all we have is a glacial 2% per year trend real gdp growth to increase this hardware gains ai hardware has been improving much more quickly than moore's law that's because we've been specializing chips for ai workloads for example we've gone from cpus to gpus and even tpus adapted chips for transformers and we've gone down to much lower Precision number formats from FP64 slash FP32 for traditional supercomputing to FP8 on H100s. These are large gains, but by the end of the decade, we'll likely have totally specialized AI specific chips without much further beyond Moore's Law gains possible. Algorithmic progress. In the coming decade, AI labs will invest tens of billions in algorithmic R&D, research and development, and all the smartest people in the world will be working on this. From tiny efficiencies to new paradigms, we'll be picking lots of low-hanging fruit. We probably won't reach any sort of hard limit, though unhobblings are likely finite. But at the very least, the pace of improvements would slow down. 
As the rapid growth in dollars and human capital investments necessarily slows down. For example, most of the smart STEM talent will already be working on AI. That said, this is the most uncertain to predict and the source of most of the uncertainty on the OOMs in the 2030s on the plot above. Put together, this means we are racing through many more OOMs in the next decade than we might in multiple decades thereafter. Maybe it's enough and we get AGI soon, or we might be in for a long, slow slog. You and I can reasonably disagree on the median time to AGI, depending on how hard we think achieving AGI will be. But given how we're racing through the OOMs right now, certainly your modal AGI year should be sometime later this decade or so. And I'm going to pause it to blow my nose. I don't think anyone wants to hear that, so I'll be right back. All right, I'm back. So Matthew Barnett, because uh, these people all love Twitter for some reason. Matthew Barnett has a nice related visualization of this considering just compute and biological bounds. So my own basic calculations suggest that given the potential for increased investment and hardware progress, we could very soon move through a large fraction of the remaining compute gap between the current frontier models and the literal amount of computation used by uh, evolution. Uh, what is what the hell does that mean? Uh, so flop required for AGI. So where we, where we find AGI, it would be 10 to the 25. Uh, how much we can scale in the near future by increasing investments, improving hardware and growing uh, GWP. Uh, okay, so this, these are kind of the stretch goals. And this is the evolutionary bound uh that's interesting what is that um let me um let me do some google on that because that interests me i'm just not sure what is meant by this Uh, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to put it in the chat GPT. There's no better place. So what is meant by the course of evolution? Is this related to biological evolution, like Darwinian evolution? I'm confused what the word evolution means in this context. Okay. Ah, that makes sense. Okay, that makes sense.
Okay. All right, so we're done with uh, part one, which is from so so this is like, uh, yeah. So this this is this is showing us that we're making progress on the you know by orders of magnitude, which which is a lot of progress. You know, it's it's inflating a soccer ball up to the size of the moon. Uh, by by the time we get to the seventh order of magnitude, up to the size of sixteen million moons. By the time we get to uh, uh, ten million uh, orders of magnitude, uh, you know, and then and then even higher than that. So dramatic, dramatic in increase, and we can see the trend lines uh, point to that. So then the next part will be uh, from. AGI to super intelligence, the intelligence explosion. And this is where this is where I'm a little confused because like you know what does it matter that what we're doing now increases by orders of magnitude if what what is happening now is not AGI? Like how, like how does it just spark magically change from whatever it is now to AGI? Like, what even is AGI? So, with that, uh, hopefully we'll learn about that in the next uh, chapter. So, thanks for uh, listening and stay tuned for the next one.